2,000 years ago in Rome, there was something considered a thousand times worse than death, becoming a prisoner of the Romans. Crassus ordered thousands of captured soldiers to be nailed alive to crosses, stretching for miles, with no end in sight, until they were all dried up in the hot sun. He wanted to send a message to Spartacus, the leader of the rebellion, that this is what happens when you go against the Romans. Not long before, the slave rebellion had split into two factions due to a disagreement between its leaders. The prudent Spartacus led half of the group to flee abroad, evading the pursuit of the Roman army. Meanwhile, the impulsive Crixus led the other half directly towards Rome, intending to attack it. Ultimately, the rebel army under Crixus was ambushed by Crassus and annihilated. Thousands of warriors became prisoners of Crassus. Crixus died on the spot, and the legendary, undefeated Gallic war god met his end. At this time, Spartacus was completely unaware of these events. One night, Spartacus discovered a few Roman soldiers roasting a rabbit and immediately led an attack. They efficiently killed the soldiers. <laughs> While clearing the bodies, Spartacus noticed the eagle and dolphin emblems on the soldiers' armor, clearly not belonging to Crassus' troops. He immediately showed the armor to Leda for identification. Once a Roman noblewoman, Leda recognized it as the insignia of Pompey's army, one of the Roman triumvirs. Spartacus was shocked, with most of Rome's main forces engaged in foreign battles. Crassus had seized the opportunity to rise. Now, it seemed one of the main forces, Pompey's army, was returning home and these soldiers were likely the vanguard sent to the Senate. Spartacus knew trouble was brewing. If Pompey's forces joined with Crassus, the rebels would face certain doom. Before they could strategize, Nasir hurriedly reported someone on horseback approaching from ahead. Spartacus went to investigate. A cloaked figure was slowly riding towards them but tumbled off the horse before getting close. They then realized the rider was the exhausted Naivia, holding the severed head of her husband, Crixus. Once Naivia regained consciousness, Spartacus learned the full story of Crixus' sacrifice. Naivia revealed that Crassus spared her life to mock and enrage Spartacus, letting him know the consequences of opposing Rome. Spartacus and Gannicus were devastated by the tragic death of their good brother, although filled with rage. Spartacus managed to keep his anger in check. The pressing issue now was how to deal with the impending arrival of Pompey's army. A successful union between Pompey and Crassus's forces could be disastrous. Despite having killed a few messengers, Spartacus knew Pompey would keep sending more. After much thought, Spartacus devised a plan. Soon, a guard in the Roman camp reported to Crassus that a messenger from Pompey had arrived. Crassus immediately summoned the messenger who informed him that Pompey was willing to join forces to eliminate the rebel Spartacus. However, as two powerful warlords, neither wanted to venture into the other's camp. They agreed to meet with 20 attendants each, at a neutral location between the two armies, to discuss strategies against Spartacus. Unbeknownst to Crassus, this messenger was an imposter sent by Spartacus. Caesar, noticing the messenger's nervous demeanor, kept silent about his suspicions, harboring his own plans to use this opportunity to get rid of Tiberius, who had humiliated him. He subtly encouraged Tiberius to represent Crassus in the meeting with Pompey. Tiberius, flattered by Caesar's rare praise, did not suspect a thing. To impress, Caesar urged his father to let him meet with Pompey. Eventually, Crassus agreed to this proposal. Was it so short a span? When he stood uncertain boy, those days have faded from memory. He stands a man now. And I wish for him all that he deserves. The next day, Tiberius led a group of soldiers to a temporary camp, following the messenger. After scouting the area, he instructed his men to attack at any sign of trouble and confidently entered the tent. Honored Pompey, my father sends regret that he could regret not. Regret is mine. to embrace the Imperator himself. Yet fate delivers me a shadow of the name Crassus. Realizing it was a trap, Tiberius rushed out and attempted to escape on horseback. Unfortunately, it was too late. Spartacus caught Tiberius' cloak, throwing him to the ground. The accompanying soldiers were quickly subdued by the rebels. Seeing the sword in Tiberius' hand, a sword once wielded by Crixus, Spartacus realized that it was Tiberius who had killed Crixus. He immediately ordered them to be brought back to the rebel camp. The sight of Tiberius being captured alive filled everyone with a desire for vengeance, especially Kore, whose eyes were filled with hatred. Spartacus, however, didn't plan to kill Tiberius immediately. Instead, 
he decided to hold a Roman-style gladiator fight, wanting Tiberius to die in the arena as a way to console the living and pay last respects to the Gallic war god Crixus. Upon learning this, Naivia was deeply moved and remorseful, she admitted her fault in previously instigating Crixus to question Spartacus's authority. Spartacus, harboring no resentment, advised Naivia to live in the present and not dwell on the past. Meanwhile, Crassus, unaware of his son's capture, was contemplating how to deal with the thousands of prisoners. Unexpectedly, Agron did not die but was captured alive by Crassus and became a prisoner, refusing to surrender until his death. Agron was immediately ordered by Crassus to be nailed to a cross. <laughs> Just then, Pompey's actual messenger arrived at Crassus' camp. Crassus learned that Pompey had not previously sent any messengers and that a troop of Pompey's soldiers had also disappeared without a trace. Realizing he had fallen for Spartacus' trick, Crassus understood that Tiberius must have been captured by Spartacus. Suspecting Caesar might have been aware of the deception, Crassus questioned him, but without evidence, he had to let it go for the time being. Like any father, Crassus was willing to pay any price to save his son, he thought of exchanging the thousand prisoners and Agron for Tiberius. Crassus ordered Caesar to be the messenger, essentially sending him to a likely death. As many in the rebel camp held grudges against him, despite arguing, Caesar had to obey his commander's orders. Before the gladiatorial fight, Corey visited Tiberius. He delusionally thought of escape, begging Corey to release him and promising to help her return to Crassus' side. But how could Corey help a man who raped her? Know that I shall return at nightfall. When it is your time to die. A thing I long to lay eyes upon. Have you ever seen such a spectacle? Tens of thousands of slaves gathered in a makeshift arena. Spartacus is going to return the favor. He's going to hold a gruesome gladiatorial tournament the way the Romans did. He intended to use the blood of Roman soldiers to honor those who had sacrificed in the rebellion and pay final respects to the Gallic war god, Crixus. After a span of two years, Spartacus and his companions once again transform into gladiators, striding boldly towards their former arena. The crowd cheers and leaps with high spirits. Spartacus, with his swords thrust into the ground, grabs a handful of yellow sand from the earth. This filthy land is soaked with the blood and tears of slaves. Today, he intends to drench it with the blood of Romans. The gladiator combat officially begins. The first Roman soldier captive is brought out, but he refuses to bow his so-called noble head to please the lowly slaves, discarding his weapon in refusal to fight. Where you stand. If a single Roman lacks courage enough to face me, send two to brace nerve! Seeing this scene, the Roman soldiers behind them no longer dared to refuse to fight. Under the combined assault, Spartacus accidentally receives a cut on his face, but he merely responds with a disdainful smile. Spartacus intends to show these self-important Romans the power of the god of the arena. Spartacus once again plants his swords into the ground and approaches barehanded. Spartacus catches the soldier by the neck in a graceful back step, pulling him into the air and precisely sending him soaring onto the guillotine. This maneuver truly frightens another soldier. With a bear hug, Spartacus tackles him to the ground and follows up with a series of swift blows, leaving no chance for the soldier to retaliate. Spartacus then picks up his sword from the ground, approaches the exhausted soldier from behind, kicks him out of the way, then leaps forward and plunges his sword hard into the soldier's eye. The scene is gruesomely unbearable, but for the slaves who have suffered under the Romans, it's immensely satisfying. Yeah! I will have more blood to honor my brother Crixus and all who follow him to the afterlife. Gannicus, take position. Send three so that I may deliver proper tribute. 
Next up is Ganicus, as the former god of the arena and the only one to win his freedom through combat. He possesses an elegant and carefree fighting style. He once effortlessly killed 12 gladiators in the arena, so dealing with three Roman soldiers is no challenge. He beheads a soldier and throws the head into the spectator stands, reigniting the atmosphere. One after another, the gladiators enter the arena and confront the Roman soldiers, none of them facing defeat. <laughs> The last and most deserving of punishment is Crassus's son, Tiberius. To allow Naedia to avenge her husband's death, Spartacus gives her the opportunity to kill Tiberius. Trained on the battlefield and by Crixus, Naedia is no longer the fragile slave girl she once was. Her swordplay is fast, accurate, and ruthless. After a series of combats, Naedia completely dominates the fight. The crowd roars with approval. Corey watches with joy in her heart. Seeing the beast who once abused her meet his deserved fate, Naedia grabbed Tiberius by the head, and just as Naedia was about to send him to God, a voice from behind her stopped her. It turns out that during their fierce battle, Caesar arrived at Spartacus's doorstep with orders from Crassus. Caesar reveals the purpose of his visit. Crassus is willing to exchange a thousand captives in Agron for Tiberius. After repeatedly confirming that it's not a trap, Spartacus hastily arrives at the arena to stop Naedia. He explains the prisoner exchange to everyone, and they all fall into silence. As their relatives and friends are among the captives, Spartacus leaves the decision to exchange or not to Naedia, as she is the one who has suffered the most. Although Naedia is reluctant, she chooses to spare Tiberius to prevent more people from experiencing the pain of losing loved ones like she did. At this moment, Corey is profoundly disappointed and decides to take matters into her own hands to ensure Tiberius's demise. The next day, Spartacus arrives at the exchange location with the hostages. Just as Caesar is about to proceed with the exchange, Corey suddenly bursts from the crowd and stabs Tiberius to death. <laughs> Though Corey has finally avenged herself, it also means that Spartacus has lost his bargaining chip. Fortunately, Corey proposes a solution, exchanging her for the hostages, as she is the woman Crassus loves deeply. Soon after, Tiberius's body is delivered to Crassus's camp. On seeing his son's corpse, Crassus is overwhelmed with grief. Thankfully, Caesar brings Corey back, but he does not reveal the cause of Tiberius's death to Crassus. This brings some solace to Crassus's heart, and he redirects all his hatred towards Spartacus, deciding to march immediately. Crassus is determined to attack Spartacus aggressively, vowing to leave him with no burial place. On Spartacus's side, seeing his former comrades returning one by one fills him with immense joy. Of course, the most heartening return for him is that of Agron. During Crixus's memorial service, Spartacus declares in front of tens of thousands of slaves his determination to fight the Romans to the bitter end. Thus, a historic battle of epic proportions officially begins. <laughs> However, Spartacus is not one to rely solely on brute force. He is well aware that his few tens of thousands of rebels are no match for the combined forces of Crassus and Pompey, totaling 200,000 soldiers. To disperse the enemy forces, Spartacus employs guerrilla tactics, dividing his rebel army into ten small units to raid Roman slave owners' estates from all directions. After each bloody raid, they leave a survivor to tell that Spartacus was responsible. The news quickly reaches Crassus. Vice Admiral Caesar was furious. This was the sixth such massacre. But the calm and experienced Crassus quickly sees through Spartacus's strategy. Even with their well-equipped army, they can't cover a thousand miles a day. Spartacus's move is undoubtedly to confuse Pompey and lead him on a wild chase. As Crassus had anticipated, Pompey's army is indeed drawn to the north. Providing the rebel army with a brief respite, Spartacus surmises that Crassus's army will soon locate their new stronghold, so he orders his men to hasten their defensive preparations. However, most of the rebel army consists of the elderly, women, children, and civilians, with only a few thousand capable of combat. 
This is clearly insufficient to face Crassus's 100,000 strong legion head on. The only plan now is to have those capable of fighting delay the Roman army, buying a little time for the elderly, women, and children to cross the Alps and escape abroad, out of reach of the Roman pursuers. For those able to fight, this is undoubtedly a battle to the death. Agrin, too, wishes to fight alongside Spartacus, but due to the brutal torture inflicted by Crassus, he can no longer even lift a sword. By seeing those who cannot fight to the mountains, turn to task with the seer and prepare for journey. Spartacus then helps his people pack up their belongings. Leda desperately wishes that Spartacus would join them in fleeing. She has now been completely captivated by this man before her. Spartacus is resolute in his decision that only by personally holding off the enemy can he create a chance of survival for the slaves. Leda expresses that she will wait for Spartacus's safe return at the foot of the Alps. What Leda doesn't know is that this farewell will be a permanent separation. Agrin seeks out Spartacus again, hoping to join the battle. This time, he comes equipped with a shield and sword, to which Nasir has added special fasteners so he can fight. Spartacus is greatly heartened to see this. Of the brothers who once escaped the gladiatorial arena with him, only Agrin remains. He is honored to continue fighting side by side with a brother with whom he shares a bond of life and death. Agrin, too, has never abandoned his vow to stand resolutely at Spartacus's side, even unto death. After making all arrangements, Spartacus formally bids farewell to those slaves who cannot fight. The time of our parting has come. Know that you will be heavy upon thought when we face Crassus and his legions. Yet know that our blood shall purchase needed opportunity for you to gain mountain paths. Part ways. And live free. Meanwhile, in the Roman camp, Crassus is also preparing for this final battle. Due to her previous betrayal, Corey's situation has drastically changed. She is now shackled. Crassus's demeanor towards her is no longer as gentle as before. Crassus once again inquires about the cause of his son Tiberius's death. Corey tells him that the killer was an old man, the mark of a slave deeply ingrained in his flesh. Because he was discontent with Tiberius's release, the old man rushed out from the crowd and stabbed Tiberius. Of course, this story was concocted by Corey and Caesar beforehand, and Crassus does not suspect it. At this moment, Caesar reports that their scouts have discovered Spartacus's new stronghold. Crassus immediately orders the full army to march. By nightfall, a hundred thousand Roman soldiers, along with catapults and crossbows, move mightily towards Spartacus's stronghold. Spartacus, no longer concealing his position, leads ten thousand rebels to confront the enemy head-on, covering the retreat of those behind. Before the battle begins, a soldier delivers a message from Crassus, inviting Spartacus for a face-to-face -face meeting. Spartacus arrived at the appointed place with a few men. Crassus has always been curious about what kind of man Spartacus, who resists all of Rome, truly is. After this battle, there may be no more opportunities to meet. The two dismiss their attendants and start a heartfelt conversation. Apologies, Imperita, I cannot give voice to regret of passing to the soldier that robbed Crixus of life. The Gaul died upon field of battle. An honor denied Tiberius. It is not as I had commanded. Yet the woman had been rudely treated by his hands. And her own claimed vengeance. Hearing this, Crassus begins to doubt whether Corey had deceived him, but Crassus remains composed, eager to understand what truly drives Spartacus to lead this slave uprising. And now you would lead thousands to join her in futile attempt. Whatever happens to my people, it happens because we choose for it. We decide our fates, not you, not the Romans, not even the gods. You choose but time and place of journey's end. Better to fall by the sword than by the master's lash. They agree to commence the battle at dawn, returning to his tent. Crassus asks Caesar again about the circumstances of Tiberius's death. Caesar continues to cover up, but Crassus trusts Spartacus's version more. Even after Crassus beats Caesar furiously, Caesar does not reveal the true killer of Tiberius. Corey was brought in, seeing Crassus in such a state of furious rage. A frightened Corey finally admits that it was she who killed Tiberius. Crassus is enraged beyond measure, just as he is about to kill Corey. Caesar reveals the truth about Tiberius's abuse of Corey. Your noble fucking son forced himself inside her. One of many acts that led to deserved fate. More lies! Uh, it is the truth! 
his love for you turned to hate in the wake of the decimation and he struck at you the only way he could. One he knew would inflict deepest wound. Crassus had a complete meltdown. Crassus is devastated that his son has taken such revenge on him, and that the woman he loves has killed his own son. Perhaps in this world, only power and glory held in one's hands will never betray. After coming to this realization, Crassus embraces Kore for the last time. No one could guess from his expressionless eyes what Crassus would do next with this woman he loved deeply. Meanwhile, in the rebel camp, Spartacus is racking his brains for strategies to defeat the enemy. In his plan, Spartacus needs a strong leader to command a thousand soldiers on a suicidal mission. At this moment, Gannicus walks in, still as unrestrained and carefree as ever, unwilling to take up any important position or specific strategy in the rebel army. That is until Spartacus asks him how victory in this war should be defined. Thought ads are held in Roman deaths. Position no longer taken. Life. Death of Romans, nor ours, nor those who follow us into battle, but the life of Sibel, of Lyta, the mother and her child, so many others. They are all Sura. If we are to give the others any chance against Crassus, you must do more than embrace it. You must lead. An old argument, Spartacus. One that must now stand settled. I cannot do this without you assuming rightful position. Well, that there is none more deserving of. What would you have me do? The impossible.